Oh, I'm glad I can inspire others. But I'm 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 just trying to read more papers. <laughs> <laughs> and put that knowledge to use in some way. I have an idea that it might be good for us to have a uh, Today I Learned repo in Agora to, like, uh, have tweet-sized or tweet-thread-sized reviews of the papers we read with a link to the YouTube and uh, uh, Simon Willison's Today I Learned is the inspiration for that. It's a, if you learn something, it's a good thing to share. And it says to the world, this is what I'm interested in. This is where I am on the path. These are the things I'm good at. It's a nice low key way of uh, broadcasting your efforts. I'm getting better at that. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Thank you. I do take notes while I'm reading. Though. I t yeah, you on, do. On every YouTube video description, I pull my notes. And I rarely, I used to take a lot of notes, but I haven't been for this. I save the paper, uh, but I rely on my memory, which doesn't share anything with other people, except when it's recorded. But still, it's good. Let me know when it's time and I'm ready to read. All right. Initiation has begun. Okay, it's January 1st, 2024, and this is the Agora Paper Group. We're reading Mobile VLM a fast, strong, and open vision language assistant for mobile devices, a paper from Mechuan Inc., Shijiang University, China, and Dalian University of Technology, China, a paper from the 30th of December, 2023. Abstract. We present Mobile VLM, a competent multimodal vision language model, MMVLM, targeted to run on mobile devices, it is an amalgamation of a myriad of architectural designs and techniques that are mobile-oriented, which comprises a set of language models at the scale of 1.4 billion and 2.7 billion parameters, trained from scratch, a multimodal vision model that is pre-trained in the CLIP fashion, cross-modality interaction via an efficient projector. We evaluate mobile VLM on several VLM benchmarks. Our models demonstrate on par performance compared with a few much larger models. More importantly, we measure the inference speed on both a Qualcomm Snapdragon 888 CPU and an NVIDIA Jetson Orin GPU. And we obtain state-of-the-art performance of 21.5 tokens and 65.3 tokens per second, respectively. And their models are available on GitHub. That is very fast for a mobile model. One, introduction. Large multimodal models, LMMs, especially the family of visual language models, rise as promising research direction for building general purpose assistance due to their substantially enhanced capability in both perception and reasoning. However, it has been challenging to connect the representations of the pre-trained language models, LLMs, and the vision models to unveil the cross-modality properties such as visual question answering, image captioning, visual knowledge reasoning, and conversation, etc. Remarkable performance on this task can be witnessed in GPT-4 and Gemini, and the evaluation of their abilities can be found in references 1 and 41. However, very limited technical details are available for these proprietary models. Simultaneously in the research community, a line of language tuning methods have been proposed. For instance, Flamingo exploits visual tokens to condition the frozen language model via gated cross-attention layers. Blip2 argues that such interaction is insufficient and introduces a lightweight querying transformer called a Q-transformer. 
Qformer that extracts the most useful features from the frozen vision encoder and feeds them directly into the frozen LLM. Mini GPT-4 aligns a frozen visual encoder from Blip2 with a frozen language model Vicuna via only one projection layer. Independently, Lava applies a simple training projector that converts the vision features into embedding tokens, which have the same dimension as the word embeddings to be processed by the language model altogether. Noticeably, trading strategies also exhibit a shift to accommodate the large-scale multimodal data of great diversity. LAVA may be the first attempt to replicate the instruction tuning paradigm from LLMs to the multimodal scenario. To generate multimodal instruction following data, it feeds textual information such as captions and bounding box coordinates of images to language-only GPT-4. Mini GPT-4 is first trained on a combined image captioning dataset and then fine-tuned on a curated alignment data dataset of image text pairs. Instruct Blip enforces vision language instruction tuning based on the pre-trained BLIP2 model where the Qformer is trained on a diverse set of datasets organized in an instruction tuning format. Mplug Owl introduces a two-stage training strategy where the visual part is uh, pre-trained first and the large language model LAMA is then fine-tuned with LoRa with instruction data from various sources. Despite the, advantage, uh, the advances mentioned above of VLMs, there is a natural demand to enable cross-modality capacities in resource-constrained scenarios. Gemini surpasses state-of-the-art performance on a range of multimodal benchmarks and introduces mobile-scale VLMs with 1.8 billion and 3.25 billion parameters for low-memory devices. Common compression techniques such as distillation and quantization are also exploited for this purpose. We aim to build the first open, mobile-scale VLMs trained using public datasets and available techniques to achieve visual perception and reasoning customized for resource-constrained platforms. That's kind of exciting. Our contributions are as follows. We present Mobile VLM, a full-stack remake of multimodal visual language models tailored for mobile scenarios. To our knowledge, we are the first to provide a detailed, reproducible, and strong vision language model from scratch. With controlled and open source data sets, we build a set of high-performing foundation language models and multimodal models. We make extensive ablation studies on the design of visual encoders and systematically evaluate the VLM performance sensitivity on various training paradigms, input resolution, and model sizes. Third, we design an efficient projector between visual and text features, which better aligns multimodal features while reducing the inference budget. Four, our model is crafted to run efficiently on mobile, low-power devices with a measured speed of 21.5 tokens per second on a Qualcomm mobile CPU and 65.3 tokens per second on a Jetson or Orin GPU, respectively. Our models prepare, uh, perform comparably on a large body of VLM benchmarks, attesting their potential in numerous tasks in practice. Although we mainly focus on edge scenarios, our model outperforms many recent VLMs which can only be supported by powerful GPUs in the cloud. Uh, do you want me to talk about the related work? Uh, We've covered quite a few multimodal models recently. Let's uh, go I to could, I'm going to talk about VLMs. Let's go to model compression. Mm -hmm. Model 2.4, Model Compression for LLMs. Large language models have brought a paradigm shift in natural language processing, while their colossal size and computational requirements pose significant challenges for real-world deployment, particularly in environments with limited resources. The size of these models often result in high memory usage and slow processing speeds. 
Additionally, the energy requirements for training and operating these models raise sustainability concerns. These challenges are becoming more pressing as LLMs continue to grow in size and complexity. In response to these challenges, model compression has emerged as a crucial research area, which aims to reduce the size and computational demands of models without significantly compromising their performance. These techniques include, but are not limited to, model pruning, quantization, knowledge distillation, and low-rank decomposition. Besides, LLM deployment tools have experienced a blossom if, uh, evidenced by industrial frameworks like TensorRT LLM, LM Deploy, and Lama.cpp being developed to tackle deployment uh, difficulties in diverse environments. Let's look at the table. Uh, and they have some. The table, uh, really uh, table one is the, the comparison of open source VLM architectures and their training corpora. Uh, let's see, Blip uh, uses a multi-model encoder decoder. So we have, as models, we have Clip, Blip, Blip 2, Instruct Blip, Blamingo, Lava, Lava 1.5, Mini GPT-4, Shikra, Mplug Owl, Cosmos 2, QNVL, Share GPT-4, and Mobile VLM. Uh, the vision encoder uh, is uh, uh, varies from VIT ResNet to a uh, clip, Eva clip VIT to VIT uh, G14 and FNet F6, uh, another variety of clip of it, uh, VLMO, open clip VIT Big G, and this one uses clip VIT L slash 14 F336. The language model also varies significantly from a transformer to MED for blip, uh, opt, flan5, uh, flan t5, flan t5 and vicuna, chinchilla, vicuna with the various sizes, llama 7b, magneto, quen lm, uh, and mobile llama, which is a new language model that they developed for this application. The cross-modality design also varies quite a bit from linear projection, cross-attention, Q-former, Q-former with FC, it would be FC in that context. Instruct blip is using a Q-former with FC. That's a linear projection. Okay. Perceiver resampler, uh, linear projection, MLP, Q-former, FC layer, uh, and uh, this model uses LDP, which is new again. Uh, the multimodal training corpus, well, there, all of these have used just about every single multimodal training corpus. Uh, but this one uses the same as LAVA 1.5. Any questions about the table? It would be nice if they had a section on performance. Um. In the table? Yeah, like, like how much better is like Cosmos or like when DL? So they oh. table three has that. Oh. Well. Oh. All right. Let's continue. Okay. Um. To um uh, overall I'm architecture design. The primary goal of it, achieving efficient visual perception and reasoning for resource-limited edge devices in mind, we designed the overall architecture of mobile VLM as illustrated in Figure 1. It contains three components. First, a visual encoder. Second, a tailored LLM for edge devices, mobile LAMA. And third, an efficient projector termed lightweight down sample projector, LDP, that aligns the visual and textual space. Uh, do we want to go over the architecture now on figure one at the top uh, of page five? And would you mind taking this, Kai? Um, sure. So here we have um, the mobile VLM architecture. 
that uses Mobile Llama as a language model and it intakes XV and XQ, which are image and language instructions, as inputs and gives um, YA as the output language response. LDP is a lightweight down sample, a down sample projector to learn the features of the image and also to project those features into the same space as the LLM's input, which is language. So basically, they're taking in another tensor, which is four dimensions, batch, channels, height, width, and they want to learn this image. So LDP will be applied exclusively to the image. So here we have on the right, we have XV, which are uh, the language or the image tokens. This is going to be fed into a vision encoder, which is in this case, what was it in this case? Clip of this. So that's going to output the raw embeddings. But now we need to learn these embeddings. So then those embeddings are going to be fed into LDP. And then those are going to be the tokens as input. And then the same thing happens to language, but there's only tokenizer. And so you see here the red and the blue are the respective tokens for each modality. These are then fed into the llama, and the output is text representing images. So on the left here, LDP, this is what's happening. We have an input tensor of F is a part of real numbers NV times DV. Then we have um, a pointwise, which a pointwise means just a convolution. Um, a, a, it's a convolution with a kernel size of 1. So then we apply glue which is an activation function. Then we apply an, another pointwise. Then we have a loop here. The, the red box is, denotes a loop in some way. So we have the input tensor is, is a, skip a skip connection now. So we're gonna skip these blocks and we're gonna add it at the end to allow the, to teach the model gradient flow and like really teach the model how to understand the flow of, of data. So we're going to apply a skip connection that's going to be saved for later. Then we apply a def wise convolution, which, which has a stride of, of one. And the a difference between def wise Deathwise and pointwise convolution are pretty small, but there's they're like it's still the same code. There's just different configurations. Um, in my implementation, you can see how this works. Um, and if you look up deathwise and pointwise convolution, here let me show you. So here's here's the difference. Check this out. Deathwise convolution. We have all these tensors and basically like we're just taking a snapshot of a row. Like the first row we got these, then and the point wise we're only taking we have three and we're kind of like merging them in a one. Um. So, am I understanding that a pointwise convolution in its context would be essentially a squishing of the three RGB layers of an image? Uh, yes.
A Delphi is a separable convolution splits a kernel into two separate kernels that do two convolutions. The Delphi's convolution and the pointwise convolution. Yeah, I would suggest learning more about this. Um, basically, the biggest difference is in the, the kernel sizes and the strides. That's where the difference comes into play. I'm a little bit puzzled why they are doing a pointwise convolution instead of something like a 2x2 two two patch, which would compress, because this is passing through the image at the original resolution, but uh, uh, not three copies of it, only one. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know. Um, going back to the paper, um, they so before we get into this, the the, the circle here means pixel wise edition, and then the the red means the layer normalization. So it comes into this for loop. We apply depth wise. Um, convolution where the stride is equal to one then we apply a layer norm then we apply a point wise another layer a layer norm then we add everything up together the output of the point wise with the original input tensor and um, we add everything up then this goes into another uh, layer where the depth wise is has uh, a stride of two and then a point wise and the output is hv is a part of real numbers and v divided by four times d4 or dv So it is sort of a compression in that uh, they're taking, uh, they're going from end to end divided by four, and the depth is re remaining the same. So if there are like an RGB plus alpha as the input, then it is a single image on the output. That would definitely reduce the processing requirements of this by four, um, which is big. And that they're doing it with a point-wise, depth-wise, uh, means that the reduction that they're trying to get is in the number of copies of the image, not the height and width of the image. Okay, I think that makes some sense to me. Um, and go back to the overall architecture design and go into the details starting on the top of page four. Taking an image x sub v in r h times w times c as input, the vision encoder f encode a sub e and c extracts the visual embeddings f in r n sub v times d sub v for image perception, per perception where n sub v equals h times w divided by p squared. 
which denotes the number of image patches, and D sub V denotes the hidden size of the visual embeddings. To alleviate the efficiency issues arising from prolonged image tokens, we scheme a lightweight projector P for visual feature compression and visual text modal alignment. It converts F into the word embedding space with an appropriate input to dimension of the subsequent language model as below. H sub V equals projector for F, where F is in the big F encoding for the input image sub V. Thus we attain the input the image tokens H sub V, which are an element in R, N sub V divided by 4 times D sub T, and text tokens X, H sub Q, which is an element in N sub T times D sub T, where N sub T denotes the number of text tokens, and D sub T denotes the hint size of the word embedding space. Observing that LLM occupies the most computation and memory consumption in the current design paradigms of MLLMs, we tailor a series of inference-friendly LLMs that enjoy advantages in speed for mobile applications. It predicts the response Y sub A, which is a, cho a choice of Y sub I from I equals 1 to the length conditioned on the multimodal input in an autoregressive matter, where L denotes the output token length. The process can be formulated as equation 2, where the probability of Y sub A given H sub vision and H sub query equals the product from I equals 1 to L for the probability of Y sub I given H sub V, H sub Q, and all of the tokens up to the Y. The visual encoder. Any questions on that? Okay. Visual encoder. Based on empirical analysis shown later in section 5.1, we leverage the pre-claimed, pre-trained clip fit L4. 14, with a resolution of 336 by 336 as our visual encoder F sub ENC. The visual transporter VIT dissects images into uniform sized patches, applies a linear embedding to each, and integrates positional encodings before feeding the resultant vector sequence into a canonical transformer encoder. Typically, a classification token is appended to the sequence for subsequent categorization tasks. Mobile Lama. For the language model, we downscale Lama to facilitate the off-the-shelf deployment, that is, our models can be seamlessly supported by almost all popular inference frameworks. Moreover, we evaluate the model latency on the edge devices to guide the model design. Neural architecture search would be a better choice, but for the time being, we keep it as our future work. The detailed setting of our architecture is shown in Table 2. Specifically, we use as the sentence piece tokenizer from LAMA2 with a vocabulary size of 32,000 and train the embeddings from scratch. This is beneficial for performing future distillation without further pain. The context length used at the pre-trained stage is 2K for all models due to limited resources. However, the context window can be further scaled to 8K for inference as indicated by 17. We apply rope to inject positional information. We apply pre-normalization to stabilize training. Specifically, we use RMS norm instead of layer norm and LLP expansion ratio 8 divided by 3 instead of 4. We also use SwigGlue activation function instead of GELU. The uh, table 2 has the detailed settings of the language models. The mobile lemma 1.4 billion has 24 blocks, a dimension of 2048, 16 heads, and a content length of 2K. 
The larger model at 2.7 billion uh, parameters has 32 blocks, a dimension of 2,560, 32 heads, and a context length of 2,000. Any questions about any of this? Three point four efficient projector. The projector between the vision encoder and the language model is critical in aligning multimodal features. There are two existing paradigms, QFormer and MLP projection. QFormer explicitly controls the number of visual tokens per query to force extracting the most relevant visual information. However, it inevitably loses the spatial positional information of tokens and suffers from slow convergence. In addition, it is inefficient for the inference on edge devices. In contrast, MLP retains the spatial information, but it usually includes useless tokens such uh, as the background. For an image of X sub V in R, H times W times C, the patch size of P, there are N sub V equals H times W divided by P squared visual tokens to be injected into the LLM model, which greatly slows down the overall inference speed. Inspired by reference 23, we can use convolutions to enhance the positional information and encourage local interaction of the visual encoder. Specifically, we explore mobile-friendly operations based on depth-wise convolution, uh, the simplest form of PEG, reference 23, which is efficient and well-supported by various edge devices. To keep spatial information and to minimize the computational cost, we make use of convolution with the stride of 2, which reduces 75% visual tokens. That's a big savings. This design significantly boosts the overall inference speed. However, our experimental result indicates that solely downsampling the token severely deteriorates the performance on downstream tasks such as OCR. To alleviate this effect, we use a more powerful network instead of a single PEG. The detailed architecture of the efficient projector called lightweight downsample projector is illustrated in figure two. Note that this projector network only contains less than 20 million parameters and runs about 81 per times faster than the visual encoder. That's amazing. We use layer normalization instead of batch normalization to make training stable and not affected by the batch size. Since the projector is already very lightweight, therefore, we don't adopt recent mobile reparameterization designs from references 21 and 117. So adding that would probably improve things. Formally, LDP, donated, denoted as bold capital P, takes the visual embeddings F in R N sub V times D sub V as input and outputs the efficiently extracted and aligned visual tokens H sub V, which is an element in R, N sub V divided by 4 times D sub T, as uh, H sub V equals capital P for F, which is a choice of F0, F1, or H sub V. Uh, F0, you're taking the uh, Visual embedding P times the weight for a GALU times the PW for F. F sub 1 equals layer norm for that. Uh, PW times layer norm for DW for F0 plus F0. And H sub V equals the layer norm times the uh, PW for the LN for DW for F1. So they're handling the first two uh, inputs differently than the following inputs. That's equation three.
experiment. 4.1 training. The whole reproducible training process is composed of three stages. Firstly, we pre-train LLM foundation models on the text-only dataset Red Pajama V1. Secondly, we perform supervised fine-tuning SFT following Vicuna on a data set of multi-turn dialogues between humans and chat GPT from third-party platforms. Lastly, we train our vision large models using multi-model datasets. Language model pre-training. Since our target is training deployable models for inference, we do not strictly follow the efficient combination of model capacity and tokens from the scaling law of 60. To make our work reproducible, all the models are trained on 1.3 trillion, trillion tokens from the Red Pajama V1 dataset only. This benefits further research by enabling controlled experiments. We apply the same sampling ratio of different data sets as in reference 115, which is shown in Table 12 in the appendix. The common autoregressive loss is adopted. We use a batch size of 5,242,880. Uh, figure 2 has the training strategy. Uh, stage 1 is a pre-training where the X sub V goes into the vision encoder which goes into the projector. Uh, X sub Q is also goes uh, at the same layer as the projector into mobile lemma. And the instruction tuning is similar in that we've got X sub V going into the vision encoder which goes into a projector which uh, projector in the pre-training is live, the other two are frozen. In the instruction tuning, both mobile llama and the projector are live. Uh, and again, X sub Q goes into mobile llama with the projector. The peak learning rate is set to 3 times 10 to the negative 4. And it decays to 3 times 10 to the negative 5 following the cosine strategy. Note that they make no mention of having a separate uh, pre-trained learning, uh, learning rate a decay strategy. Uh, that was something that was interesting in the paper we read last time. Uh, we warm up with 2,000 iterations. We use the Atom W optimizer with beta sub 1.9 and beta sub 2.95 and a weight decay regularization of 0.1. The gradient clipping threshold is set to 1. We adopt the PyTorch Lightning framework with deep speed backend. We use 0, 1 from reference 98 and gradient accumulation to retrieve a training speed of 18,800 tokens per second on a GPU for the 1.4 billion model and 8,500 tokens second for a GPU on the 2.7 billion model on 20 nodes equipped with eight NVIDIA Tesla A100 GPUs each. So this is a fairly hefty model to train, uh, the large one. The smaller one um, is faster to train. They don't say how long uh, it takes to train, but it's going to be a while on that even that many uh, that's a lot of GPUs. Uh, furthermore, we favor flash attention V2 to alleviate the I.O. bottleneck and to train faster. We randomly shuffle the data to disturb the sequential order with a fixed seed, which is vital. Uh, since the training process can be intermittently interrupted and requires to be resumed, we don't need a fixed seed for that. Uh, we first tokenize the raw data into IDs and serialize them into many bucket files. We then use memory mapping to deliver uh, desired I.O. speed. Uh, besides, we pack different sentences together where an EOS token is inserted to set different se sentences apart. We don't describe the packing technique. Due to limited resources, we do not try the des design of intern LM which is reference 113, which may improve the overall model performance by disabling such packing. The overall training loss decreases as the consumed tokens increase and is shown in figure 3. Uh, table 3 
uh, has the comparison with state-of-the-art mobile scale language models on mainstream language benchmarks. The large version of this uh, is uh, so they don't mark in bold the best performance of all of these. They are. Uh, for the large model, uh, it is very similar to Insight 3B and Open Lama 3B with what I would consider to be uh, small differences on all of the benchmarks. And for their small model, which is compared to Tiny Lama 1.1B, Galactica, uh, Galactica 1.3B, Opt 1.3B, and Pythia 1.4B, uh, again, the uh, differences on all of the benchmarks are what I would consider to be small. So it is as good as anything else out there, and perhaps slightly better. Not a huge performance improvement, but definitely up with what the state of the art is. Uh, the training loss curve shows that the loss uh, rapidly decreases uh, from the start down to a layer where it does not improve much after about uh, uh, 2 million tokens. It really, in this uh, uh, scale of diagram, I can't tell the slope difference between uh, 2 million and uh, 1.2 billion tokens. Um, in the SFT loss curves of Mobile Lama 1.4b and 2.7b, it suggests to me that the training for 2.7b was cut off early, and uh, in both cases the loss curves were significantly declining. Uh, they do exhibit that uh, what I, I think it's called the epoch drop. Um, which maybe uh, I think Jeremy Howard has described that as a known feature and they don't know why it happens. Um, and both of them could have been trained for a lot longer uh, to get a lower loss. SFT on language models. As clarified by LAMA 2, Fewer high-quality examples from their vendor-based annotation efforts significantly improve the results. We are thus motivated to fine-tune our mobile LAMA on a high-quality data set with supervised learning. Icuna fine-tunes LAMA on user-shared conversations collected from shared GPT, which is widely used as a language module for multimodal model building, but their training data set is not released. We employ a data set of multi-turn dialogues between humans and chat GPT from third-party platforms, which has been cleaned through a process of format standardization and quality refinement. The SFT data is organized following the Vicuna format, where each sample consists of a dialogue including several user prompts and chat GPT answers. As shown in Table 14 in the appendix, a special token is used to separate the assistant's answer and the next round of user prompts. For the training details, we use a cosine learning rate schedule without weight decay, a global batch size of 128, and a sequence length of 2,048 tokens. We use an autoregressive objective and perform backprop only on answer tokens. To achieve better performance in downstream tasks, we conducted experiments to select the appropriate hyperparameters. We fine-tuned for three epochs with a learning rate of 2 times 10 to the negative 5 for Mobile Lama 1.4b, and two epochs with a learning rate of 3 times 10 to the negative 5 for Mobile Lama 2.7b. The training loss inc decreases with iterations, as shown in Figure 4. To be later shown in Section 5.4, our empirical performance on downstream tasks demonstrates that high-quality SFT data is essential to aligning LLMs with dialogue-style instructions. 
Any questions on this? BLM training. Similar to references 76 and 126, the whole training process comprises two steps, pre-training and instruction tuning, as depicted in Figure 2. During the first step, we freeze the vision encoder and LLM, focusing on training the efficient projector only. Subsequently, we fine-tune both the projector and LLM to enhance the abilities of visual understanding and expression by refining the language model via a language modeling loss function. Following Vicuna's hyperparameters, we pre-train our model on the filtered CC595K subset for one epoch at a learning rate of 10 to the negative 3 and a batch size of 256. We fine-tune it on the LAVA Instruct 158,000 data set for one epoch at a learning rate of 2 times 10 to the negative 5 and a batch size of 128. Examples of our training data set are shown in Figure 5 in Appendix C. We chose the Atom W optimizer with no weight decay and a cosine learning rate with a warm-up of 3%. The training takes 5 hours with 8 NVIDIA Tesla A100 GPUs for mobile uh, VLM 1.7B and 8 hours for mobile VLM 3B. So that doesn't take very long. Evaluation of mobile LAMA. Uh, in Table 3, we es extensively assess our models on two standard natural language benchmarks for language understanding and common sense reasoning, respectively. Uh, we use the language model evaluation harness tool for the former assessment and uh, it is on par with the other models and I'm going to keep going because I think it's really uh, very similar. Go to uh, the uh, in ablation I'm study on vision backbones, please. Okay. Oh, okay. In Table 7, we compare the multimodal performance at varying model scales and different numbers of visual tokens. All experiments are conducted with clip fit as a visual encoder. We configure different model sizes, scales, patch sizes, and types of vision language projectors. Impact of model scales. As the model scales up, the multimodal performance on six benchmarks maintains a gradual increased trend under the same projector. However, it can be observed that the gain brought by the visual model scaling may gradually become saturated at a certain amount of training data. Next, the impact of the number of visual tokens. Compared with rows 4 and 5, our proposed LDP module reduces the number of visual tokens from 576 to 144, which is a 75% reduction, and it finally achieves performance equivalent to, or sometimes better, than the baseline. This reveals that the quality of visual tokens can be further improved, while our proposed LDP model is quite effective. Impact of pre-training paradigms. Furthermore, we show the performance of Mobile Llama 1.4b under different vision backbone pre-training paradigms in Table 8. Based on the cost of annotation and pre-training, we roughly classify these paradigms into four categories. It turns out that the performance of Mobile VLM gradually improves as the pre-training cost increases. The vision encoder pre-trained with supervised image text alignment achieved the best performance. By comparing SWIN-based S38G Dyno and VITB P14S224, we noticed that the model pre-trained by grounding detection achieved relatively comparable performance to the clipped pre-trained model on GQA, SQA, Pope, and MME. This outcome indicates that the image level alignment has greater potential to strike better performance than object level, especially by using more visual tokens or more training data. In addition, 
better image net performance of pre-trained models, that is SWIN greater than VIT, often corresponds to more general feature extraction capabilities and mobile VLM will have certain performance gains in turn. Section 5.2, ablation on VL projectors. Motivated by the fact that both feature interaction and token interaction are beneficial, we use depth-wise convolutions for the former and point-wise for the latter. Table 9 shows the performance of various VL projectors. Row 1 in Table 9 is the module used in LAVA, where only the feature space is transformed through two linear layers. Row 2 adds a depth-wise convolution before each point-wise for token interaction, which performs 2x downsampling with a stride of 2. You notice that the performance begins to show an evident decline. Based on the setup of 144 tokens, adding two front end point wise layers brings more feature level interactions, which makes up for the performance loss caused by token reduction. Rows 4 and 5 show that adding more parameters does not achieve desired gains. Rows 4 and 6 show that the downsampling of tokens at the end of the projector has a positive effect. This is all from uh, Table 9, Table 10. 5.3 visual resolution and token numbers. Since the number of visual tokens directly affects the inference speed of the whole multimodal model, we compare two types of design, reducing the input resolution, RIR, and using a lightweight downsample projector, LDP. Without loss of generality for an image of H times W with a patch size of P, the former strategy generates HW divided by P squared tokens. For the latter, it produces HW divided by four times P squared tokens using a downsampling ratio of two. We use H equals W equals 336. P equals 14 for the LDP, and H equals W equals 168, P equals 14 for the RIR to keep the total number of tokens as 144. Uh, the result from Table 11 verifies the effectiveness of the proposed LDP. Uh, the token reduction shows that the LDP uh, has better performance on all of the benchmarks than the RIR. Uh, by uh, that I would consider to be s small but significant amounts. Uh, 5.4 quantitative analysis on SFT. Vicuna fine tuned on Lama has been widely chosen in large language models. We further explore how SFT affects our language model's performance in downstream tasks. Two common SFT paradigms, Alpaca and Vicuna, are compared in Figure 10. We find that the scores of SQA, VQA, MME, and MMBench can all be significantly enhanced. It demonstrates that fine-tuning large language models in Vicuna dialog mode with the data from shared GPT ultimately achieves the best performance. Better integrate SFT's prompt format with the training of downstream tasks, we ablate the conversation mode on mobile VLM to find Vicuna underscore V1 performs best. Conclusion. In a nutshell, we present mobile VLM, a set of efficient and high-powered mobile-scale vision language models tailored for mobile and IoT devices. In its making, we refurbish both language models and vision projection models. Yeah, extensive experiments are to conducted to choose proper vision backbones, to design an efficient projector, and to enhance model capacity by training schemes like language model SFT, a two-stage training strategy involving pre-training and instruction tuning, and LoRa fine-tuning. 
the performance is evaluated vigorously on mainstream VLM benchmarks. Mobile VLMs also show an unprecedented speed on typical mobile and IoT devices. We believe that mobile VLM will open new possibilities for widespread applications like multimodal assistance deployed on mobile devices or in self-driving cars and more broadly embodied AI robots. What did you think of this kind? I think it's um, 8 out of 10 paper. Um, I don't know if they released the code, but they pretty much do everything pretty well. They have the diagram, they break down and they benchmark and explore the projector design. And they're trying to solve the multimodality alignment problem, which as you could probably imagine is a very, very big problem. <laughs> um, because the faster these models can become multimodal and like have like common sense reasoning is is obviously amazing because then we can deploy these agents in the real world and in phones or robots or cameras or in any other um in any other capacity so i honestly believe that i honestly believe that this paper is really useful um in the sense that it provides a new projector design. Yeah. I think it's a good paper. I probably uh, wouldn't quite put it at an eight, but close. Uh, it was, uh, the design is interesting. Um, but they are able to get uh, a state-of-the-art multimodal model this small is very interesting. Uh, that they uh, they did publish their code and it looks to be at least a decent starting point by looking at the repository just now. Um, the training cost is small enough to be able to do repeated tests on. Uh, checking hyperparameters and the impact of um, uh, uh, the training data. Also, uh, the training cost is small enough that one could train the larger model for longer, which might uh, have some improvement. Um, and I'd be very interested in seeing what happens on these small good models if one is to start doing the sort of uh, model ab model ablations, that is removing um, paths through the model that don't actually add anything important, and getting them even smaller. Mm. This uh, whole mobile uh, VLLMs is very, very interesting because, yes, it means that we'll be able to do real stuff. Uh, a uh, much smaller model might allow us to actually add audio, which would be interesting. Um, but even if there was a separate audio model, uh, which did uh, speech to text as part of this, it probably would work fine, and most phones have that uh, now. Uh, so the thing that would need to be added would not be uh, image generation, but rather action generation or decision generation for a mobile device, which both of which would be interesting. We live in a very exciting time. Absolutely. Thank you, Kai. Yep. Um. I must admit, the I just checked out the repo and they have pretty good code. It's not like completely n not understandable in any way. It's pretty Maybe simple. they've been reading your code. Hopefully.
it is pretty clean and understandable. Um, Are the models up on Hugging Face yet? I don't know if the multi-model one is. Others might be. Oh yeah, they are. The, both the 1.7B and 3B uh, and the chat and the base are both up. We're all up there. So we're good. Nice. Nice. Now let's see if I can add this to swarms. That'd be awesome. Well, that's it. Um, this paper's good. Um, I think people people forget about the end goal a lot. People and forget about the objective when they're in the process of getting to the objective. I think that it's always best to keep the objective at the forefront of your mind at all times so you never forget why you're doing what you're doing. And in this scenario, the end objective is deploying models that are common sense, have common sense, can reason, and are useful in the real world. On phones, robots, self-driving cars, and other mediums. And we have to rapidly, we have to rapidly accelerate the deployment by exploring design spaces and benchmarking them and selecting the best ones and scaling those up. And then open sourcing the models so everybody else can rinse and repeat on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how much of an improvement happens by being able to, to use a frozen layer that's pretty good and then training it to be better. And then releasing that and letting somebody else do the same thing. Yeah, about fucking 20 papers have done that. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's starting to like, uh, start a snowball into something much bigger. The uh, technique from the paper we read that was based on Phi 2 with the really interesting uh, learning rate adaptations and the addition of audio, we could do that with this model now because it doesn't depend on Phi 2. They released a good model we could use. Wow. And so every day it feels like, I don't know, what used to be years or months of improvement it's happening every day now. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, somewhere in the paper, I think, um, in the 2.4 model compression for LLMs, we mentioned about LLM deployment tools, uh, like TensorRT LLM, LLM deploy, Lama.cpp. Uh, when do we need it and when should we not use it? Uh, do we have any view on those things? Because usually we use, whenever we deploy our models, we use some sort of inference engine like PGI, uh, VLLMs, uh, those kind of inference engine to get the faster inference outputs. But where these things come into picture? C can you say that again? Yeah. Oh, my headset isn't good. Give me 
price against them on GMAX. So I believe you're discussing 4.5, which is the latency measurement on mobile devices. No, it's 2.4. It's 2.4. 2.4? So they use Lama CPP for deployment, uh, mentioned in, in uh, 4.5, which is going to be fast. So I think about the fastest you can get now. And in 2.4, we talk about model compression. So they're using not all of the techniques, but. Uh, yeah, we know that. We know that. My question is, why do we need uh, LLM deployment tools? Uh, what value they brings when we have inference engines like TGI, LLMs? Um, why? I'm sure that. Yeah. What do you mean, why? How is it different than normal TGI? Next generation interfaces. So, I want you to think about this. So, do you like? Do you is your body just made out of skin, or are there different organs? Different organs. Okay. What What is the organ that powers everything? Without this organ, you would die. I don't know. Every organ is vital. Heart, let's say, brain. All right. Let's let's say your heart, right? So the heart pumps out blood, which is basically information to all your cells and all your other organs. And so you're, you're looking at this as if just normal text generation is like skin, but there's many different layers of complexity that you're not seeing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Llama C++ implements everything in what, C++ or CUDA? And so they optimize different organs so that the inference is much faster or much more reliable. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. so, so can we talk about a use case where this, this become absolute vital? We have to use them. Tai Chi won't fly in those situations. Are you asking him when to use yeah. Llama C++? Is that what you're asking? Uh, not necessarily Llama C++. So let's say Tensor RT LM, LM Deploy. Oh, that, that, okay. So you would use these type of frameworks if you just really want to optimize the fucking shit out of your app. Like really, really hard. If you want it to be really fast, or really reliable, these are some of the steps you would take. But it's it's obviously not like necessary. You know, it's not like Exactly. You know, it's not like a, a bare requirement that if you didn't do it you would just like you wouldn't be able to use the model at all. It's just another way to increase reliability in some way through inference speed or precision, etc. So, so for our intra organization chat UI setup, we use TGI and we are able to handle more than 200, 300 requests at a time. So that is doing pretty well. So I was wondering whether, when do we need actually this Tensor RT? And Tensor RT is a proprietary thing of NVIDIA. Not very sure. Yeah, so about I would use Tensor RT. Um, I would use Tensor RT if I really want to just like optimize the shit out of my model, like really hard. Um, like they have quantization, they have um, flash attention, they have a whole bunch of stuff. So these things are also in built in. But definitely, it must be bringing something else in some sort of a more organized way or something. 
Yeah. Um, another thing, mostly the biggest benefit is speed. Um, because if you think about it, like most things in bare PyTorch is not as optimized as as if it would be in in um, just bare CUDA or C++. Yeah. The, the speed is, is unimaginable. So, yeah. This is good. As, with, as with many performance choices, it all depends on what is the thing that you're working <laughs> with in with which budget, what uh, are the um, capacities you already have, uh, what yeah. have you evaluated as your choices, and uh, Lama CPP is free and uh, fairly fast on inference. Um, yeah, there, there are so many options available and just uh, sometimes become uh, very difficult to draw a very strong line or distinguish among all these options. So, as Kai said, you really want to keep the end goal in mind. It's very easy to get into an optimization for optimization set on a treadmill. What is the outcome you're trying to achieve? And is the speed of inference the constraint on it? Or is no, it something else? No, no, let's say speed. Let's pick one dimension, which is the speed. Now, which one would you pick? Do we have a so clear-cut demarcation? Of, yeah. well, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Well, uh, we, we finalize the dimension of speed, right? generation of tokens fast as much as possible if you wanted to really, idea. if you wanted to increase speed mm -hmm. you could just quantize you could quantize the layers using something like neva and you would get you would gain an unimaginable speed increase by just quantizing certain layers so the the tensor rt if you look at the documentation, because I still don't know what they have. We have a lot yeah. of shit. So I don't like I don't know everything that they have, but they have implementations of stuff in C. So it, that's like are are you really just trying to get the extra juice in your car? Like how fast do you want your car to be? You know, this is like adding like a, this is like, like Tensor RT is like adding a V8 engine to like a Toyota. You know, like it's. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, so we, you a, did a, a basic implementation of something in PyTorch um, is not that fast compared to C++. But you, like I said, the, the first thing that you could do to gain a lot of increase in speed would be quantization. And for that, I would suggest you use Neva, as it's probably the simplest algorithm. Or we have a lot of stuff in Zeta that you could check out too. We have a lot of sure. uh, we have a lot of uh, quantization stuff, and um, we actually. So I would say quantization so, so, uh, is the first thing that you should do. Then maybe go into Llama C plus plus. And then the last thing would probably be Tensor RT. Yeah, that, that's the usual thing. So unless and until we we sort of try with every sort of tools, uh, we couldn't say really uh, what is it that gives them an extra edge. And I believe the community uses the tool most. It becomes, for example, Lama.cpp, uh, slowly getting matured, so many benchmarks, so many different implementations are there so could be right. then picking something like in But again, it really depends on the application. Sometimes speed really matters, but also sometimes the quality of the yeah. uh, responses matter. Um, because uh, a wrong, 
a wrong fast response uh, is not a good thing. Totally, totally. So that's what we have to probably do a lot of permutation combination, do a lot of benchmarking with different tools, and then pick one. Yes. So that's yes. what I was saying. Yeah, we have to. There is no clear uh, sort of benchmarking available uh, among all these tools. There's so many options, and it becomes very difficult for me to justify to people in org uh, that which one to pick. Why are you picking this one? Why not? I have, and they read certain random articles, and they come. Oh, this happened. So why don't we use that? <laughs> That's what I was looking for, certain thing, but yeah. Yes. And again, focus on the business outcome you're trying to achieve. It's very yeah. easy to spend a lot of time optimizing something that doesn't make any difference. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice advice, yeah. And, and and just one more thing, sorry, I'm extra, adding extra question. So okay. there are a lot of multi-modal architecture design they talked in certain table, right? Um, let me open that. Is it here? Yeah, I think table one. Uh, they talk about cross-modality designs, and there we have. The cross attention, Q former. I understand Q former is from Blip. Um, have you have you covered uh, most of the cross modality design in recent paper read? Or, yes. For example, okay. I believe so, and I believe Kai has actually implemented all of these, except for oh. LDP, which you may have done today in swarms. So there are, will be examples of all of them in swarms. Oh. Great work, Kai. Thanks. Yeah. Oh yeah, Kai. Kai's up on things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually finishing out the implement, uh, implementation now of um, MLDP uh, or okay. LDP, the uh, main projector that they used in this paper. So I'm implementing that right now. So cross attention is the usual standard thing. I, I think uh, with Avalon we read um, encoder representation, two decoder representation. That mapping is usually cross attention. Uh, Q former. Uh, what about this perceiver sample resampler? Uh, have we implemented that as well? Yeah. So if you look up just perceiver um, architecture. You could see what it is. It's basically just a bunch of attentions um, and a couple linears. Um, but th those papers were actually pretty good. Those came out in 2021. And basically, it's just a pretty general architecture for like any modality. So you can use, um, they use images. They, they, they're actually one of the first papers to take in multiple forms of modalities and conditionally generate audio or video or whatever the hell you want, really. Oh, which paper is it? Perceiver and Perceiver I.O. by Google. Right. I shall put this into paper channel. Thank you. So it tries to be a one neural network design for multiple input data types. Yeah, that, that, that is sort of a core essence of multimodal design architecture, yeah. bringing the two different embeddings into one space. Yes. Yeah, this is some, some old school stuff. Two, three years old now, but it's still very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the perceiver resampler is just... Um, it's just an attentions. 
and um, it's it's just attentions and linears and cross attentions, cross attentions, linears and attentions in some alignment. Okay, please have a very good blog on that. I'll share that as well. On what? On Perceiver. Oh, I'm listing that on the That's cool. chat. I didn't know that. So what's the link to the paper you guys are discussing? Mobile VLLM. It's in the papers channel. I just shared that procedure I no. Thank you. So, uh, Dimitri, as you missed the paper, the big innovation here was that they have trained a new open source language model in two sizes, a little under 2 billion and a little under 3 billion, uh, which are good multimodal models uh, suitable for running on mobile devices. Models are open source. We have introduced a new receiver layer, uh, which uh, significantly reduces the number of tokens required to uh, tokenize an input image into a visual language model. Um, it have not quantized the model that I could tell though they did. They have deployed it on Lima CPP and it uh, is really impressive for uh, the design and the training. They trained it on eight eight one hundreds in less than twenty four hours. Eight eight one hundreds. For less than a day. Did did they're not pre training this. They're just this is fine tuning. You could fine tune you could probably fine tune this faster than that. But the pre training definitely took a lot longer. It's that eight hours from the three billion and five hours for the uh, uh, one point seven. So very brief fine tuning. And uh, you can do the same because the models are in Hugging Face and the code is on GitHub. Yeah, it's fine tuning. Yeah, it's a big difference. It's a good idea. So, so they never shared the code for pre training or they just use the frozen model, smaller models? They use the frozen model. Is there a code? Is there any code for training at yeah. all? I don't know. No, there is not. That's interesting. So I don't, I don't fully understand the contribution of their work. Like, they took a language model that that was the they trained a language model, and then they took. Or like they did they train the whole thing? It's not. Or did they take something pre-trained? It's not. They took a pre-trained language model. Then they created a new multimodal projector design that enabled them to be state of the art in some ways. And then they fine-tuned this. So this is not just language. This is multimodal. Okay. So most of the paper was probably going over the way the projector method. Whatever yes. that is. Yes. Right, that sounds cool. Yeah. So, and I'm currently finishing up my implementation of this now, if you would like to check it out. Go, 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 go. Well, they obviously already have the code open, but I'm just implementing this in Zeta. So I could show everyone how simple it is to use.
Yeah. And for practice. Yeah. You gotta practice writing code every day. Every day! Who will become a book? A book? A book in terms of references, all reference implementation. They also take a pre-trained vision model, right? And then they project from from vision to language and from language to vision, or into a common space. So it's a we, 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 it's a three-step process. You have an image sent to vision encoder, which is clip. Then the big innovation of this paper is the projector. So they create a whole new uh, module called LD LDP which um, consists of a bunch of, of convolutions, point-wise and depth-wise convolutions. And so basically the flow is image, vision, encoder, then the clip, the output of clip is sent into the LDP layer, and then that is um, sent into the transformer. But isn't the output of clip just a score? Oh, like the, the hidden dimension? The hidden state what? of clip. This clip just gives you a score usually. Like the output of clip is just a score, no, right? Yeah, yeah. But in this case, they're taking the embeddings from clip. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can get just the raw embedding of the image. You don't need to get a score. Where's this? Three-step process. If you go down one it's, of the pages, uh, it's on page five. Yeah. Excuse the text. Okay. Excuse the query. Oh, like you're asking questions about the image? Yeah, they, they use the uh, uh, Icuna question answering format, and they use the um, data which was derived through share GPT from public conversations with GPT-4 is the training data. We should probably read, there's three papers in the Perceiver series. Oh, uh, so the tr so do they freeze the whole, do, like, um, do they train Mobile Llama as well, and Vision Encoder as well? Why? Or is that frozen? They fine tune it, they don't pre-train it. Okay. Yeah, so, the again, the whole premise of this paper is to explore projector design spaces to create small but intelligent multimodal models that can be developed. Yeah, I was like I was like, how's that possible? But then they cheated by using GPT-4 data. <laughs> well, it's like, how do you, I was like, how do you get the data to train something like this? <laughs> um, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, the, you can see... The well, I mean, stuff. okay. You so, can, okay, you can, you I'm can. looking at this diagram with the three-step process. Like, you take the image, you pass it through clip, and then you have an untrained projector at one point. At one point, the projector is untrained. And then the projector gives you some random shit, and then you pass that <laughs> to Llama. And then Llama is going to say some, some random shit because it got some random shit as input. And then what is the, the criteria that you say, no, Llama, you're wrong. That's random shit. Instead, I wanted this. 
and the this comes from GPT-4 data. So, yeah, I mean, now, now it makes sense. How big is, how big is the projector? What do you mean, how big? It's a hundred lines. Like, how many, how many parameters? 20 million, I think. So just, does it just project into tokens? Yes. So the output of the projector is the visually aligned tokens. They're going to be integrated with the text tokens. So they're going to be embedded as well. Yeah, I mean, it's cool, but it, re it requires, it's like, it doesn't push us forward because it requires that data. Um, what data? The GPT-4 data. You need a whole bunch of vision answer question data. Dude, look at the bottom. They have not mentioned GPT-4 anywhere in this paper. So they, they are using the shared GPT data set, which is public. And so I'm not sure what you're confused about, Dimitri. Um, they, they just use common visual multi-model data sets. They're not like GPT-4. There's a whole table on this on page three. A handcrafted data set is enough to train such a projector. Yeah. They really emphasized that they needed good quality data. And they talked a little bit about how they determined that particularly, and that it really did make a difference to use high quality data instead of more data. Do some examples. There's just no examples. There Where's the, the examples? They're in the appendix. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> Dimitri reminds me of Dimitri reminds me of some <laughs> Dimitri reminds me of some guy on, on some guy on Reddit. It's just always like mad at everybody. <laughs> I have a headache. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> Like these fucking, there's no fucking GPT-4 generated data. Fuck these people. Thanks, guy. <laughs> I just don't believe in getting excited by papers anymore. Why not? So I'm like suspicious when something, when there's something good. Cause I don't know. Dude, you uh, me? I don't you know. I'm a, jaded. You would be a good person to like fucking review movies on like Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> be like the most critical person ever. It's like these fucking idiots. They had a fucking scene where they didn't do shit. Fucking useless. Zero out of ten. So, so there are three papers, right? You said one I found on Perceiver IO. I think with iterative attention. Mm -hmm. General perception with iterative attention. The one you shared is called. I think it released on 2022. The one I was talking in 2021. Long context order regressive model you can perceive AR. Okay, is there a third one also? Uh, yeah, there is a third one. So the wow, perceiver, mobile. The perceiver. It just knows like. Sorry. The perceiver uh, resampler is the last one I sent. So it came out in 20, uh, 2023. I just sent all oh, you of them. Say? I just sent okay. all of them. Yeah, I sent that, yeah. Thanks, thanks, guy. Fuck yeah. 
All right, so. Thank you, Laura. Stuff go yuck. Oh, it's going uh, good. I am able to train um, uh, few lower adapters. I was able to train Mixtrel as well. Fine tune, rather. Train. I was able to fine tune Mixtrel. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there was some requirement that could come, which is um, uh, increasing the context length of models. So that's why I was exploring something called long LoRa, uh, wherein you can increase the context length of models which are pre-tained on usually the smaller context length of 1024. So there is a very good technique. Uh, I have read the paper. And if you leverage that technique, you can increase the context length of the model which are trained on smaller context lengths. Mm -hmm. That sounds like excellent progress. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is this a, long okay. Like, okay, the tr the skateboarder. So the okay, the I mean the answers are pretty good, but the skateboarder isn't jumping over any obstacle, and it says that he he is, and then like, the the plane isn't doesn't look like it's taking off. I guess I guess if it's I guess if it's close up, it could be taking off or landing. I guess especially when the gear is down. Okay, it's just a skateboarder. Whatever. It's still not AGI. <laughs> it is. I'm just waiting for AGI. <laughs> Dude, why why are you waiting, man? You have to go out there and make it happen. Waiting is not going to help. You need to make it happen. I don't have... I believe in you. 5,000... A100s. <laughs> Even those wouldn't cut it. You just need 8. Yeah, you need 20,000. Yeah, that's the size I did the math. That's the size of Facebook's cluster. So... Facebook has a cluster of 20,000 A100s? Probably more than that now. My math was optimistic, though. You probably need more than that. Um, I don't know. The, how, how much do A100s cost? $10,000 each? No. Probably more. 15. 15,000. Oh, that's cheap. Oh, so you just 15,000 times... 15,000 times... Twenty thousand. <laughs> That's a lot of zeros. Fifteen thousand yeah, times twenty thousand. Dude, that's fucking. That's like fucking fun coupons for Elon Musk. <laughs> probably surprisingly cheap size now. 